So good morning. Please let me know if you can hear me. Mm, just drop a thumbs up or something so that I can know. Hi, sir, and thank you. Good morning. Okay, just just let me know like whenever we are ready, and we can just get kick started. All okay. All right. Okay. 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 So we are getting almost like 54 viewers. We'll just wait for a sec. Uh, till then, I'll just uh, mention that it's really good to see more and more like dentists and stomatologists. They are more and more getting into this uh, facial cosmetic and plastic surgery thing because I think if not us, uh, if not the ENT trained, if not the maxillofacial surgeons, if not the dentists, if not the oculoplastic surgeons, then whom? And yeah, definitely, because the plastic surgeons, they are trained more for soft tissue augmentation and reconstruction. So definitely, they, they have a huge role to play, but provided that in India, we don't have too many cosmetic procedures. So essentially, the training for all this is quite limited in India, per se. Um, and maxillofacial surgeons, as well as dentists, they have uh, quite a huge understanding of the orthodontic and automatic relationship. So uh, I think we still have a long way to go and evolve our specialization and play a great role, J just like uh, elsewhere in some other countries, let's say US or elsewhere like in the, in the UK or even in the European Union, as well as here in China mainland, as well as in Korea. It's like uh, the dentists are doing like the facial cosmetic procedures not essentially all the plastic surgery thing, but definitely the cosmetic procedures, which might be non-surgical. Yeah, and depending, if, if you have a huge amount of training in the cosmetic procedures, uh, you can still pursue that as a uh, part of your profession or as something in your daily practice. So with this, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I've done my bachelor's from India and my master's in maxillofacial surgery, and that too from Hong Kong, and after that, I got uh, my license in Hong Kong and now in China, and uh, I, I'm a trained, uh, fellowship trained facial plastic surgeon. I was trained in Europe as well as in Seoul, like I was trained there full time in South Korea. So my particular interest is in uh, the facial cosmetic sur surgical procedures, not the reconstructive ones, but definitely the plastic and cosmetic sur surgical procedures. So I'm working here for Raffles Hospital and uh, that's a Singapore owned enterprise and I'm working here as a facial cosmetic and plastic surgeon. So th this is all about my introduction and uh, as the topic itself says like uh, we are going to see the trends in Asian facial plastic surgery. Uh, the reason behind choosing Asian is um, because South Korea is considered as a hub for the cosmetic procedures and on an average uh, it's been believed that uh, an average person undergoes more than like 4.5 or it's close to five surgical procedures or cosmetic procedure to, to, to enhance their appearance. So it's more of a trend thing and it's more of an established phenomenon uh, in the Asian countries and definitely now in China. And with time, as uh, I have witnessed, like I have, been training some students for uh, cosmetic surgical procedures as well in, as in India. So uh, I have seen the latest uh, trends even in India that people are getting more and more uh, of, uh, uh, they're like, especially the med medicals, they're getting into more of this kind of practice because uh, there are more and more clients, I, I guess, like uh, to undertake these procedures. And the good thing now is essentially what it used to be a couple of years ago, uh, it's quite different nowadays. Nowadays, it's basically a daycare procedure or just like a very minimal procedure. Maybe you just take a couple of shots and you're good to go back home. And you can get, get to see instant results for maybe in two or three weeks. So in this way, it's something which is quite promising in terms of cost, uh, in terms of your training. It's not essentially like that long for now because of the new treatment modalities. Not all the cases of facelift need to be done or need to be, you know, 
uh, attended by a very progressive approach. You can rather go to a simpler one. So uh, today, like in this presentation, I will take you through the uh, procedures which we are performing on a daily basis. Uh, I do have uh, most of my cases. Uh, I'm just sharing pictures, like a couple of pictures over here, and I'll try to explain. And if you got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So it will depend, like if I could take the questions midway, I'll definitely take them. And if not, uh, I, I'll reward you back later. All right, so let's get started. So um, the facial cosmetic surgery procedures would be like forehead lift. So I'll be using my face to explain it to you. So th this is like the forehead as we know. So due to aging and due to, uh, you know, appearance issues like in aging faces, um, because the profile is quite different. So people might require, uh, with, with age, they might require some augmentation or they would require some rejuvenation of the, this particular area. So this would require a forehead lift. So I'm not sure if you can see, if we give a lift over here like this, it will raise our forehead as well as our uh, eyebrow. So usually the forehead lift is combined with the eyebrow lift. And uh, the next procedure is blepharoplasty, and it's like for the upper eyelid as well as for the lower eyelid and rhinoplasty, which is for the nose, and facial implants uh, with aging face, uh, you know, like, well, we, we can do the augmentation of the cheekbone and the malar prominences, as well as chin, as well as for jaw lines. And there is lip shortening or lip reprovisioning procedure. There is earlobe repair, as well as otoplasty, like for the protruding ears, uh, as well as like uh, some people, they are missing their auricular cartilage. So as to, uh, you know, generate an ear over there. And the other one is liposculpting of face, which is like um, using fat or just taking out fat to, to give it a new sculpture, which is more aesthetic. The next one is some mental liposuction, or it could be liposuction from rest of the parts of, of the face. And the next one is orthognathic surgery. I am pretty sure like, all of us, we, we have a fair good idea of the orthognathic surgery. And the other ones are anti-aging treatments. So these are, these are uh, most of the procedures which the, you know, even like the general practitioners and uh, maybe the people who are not so uh, surgically trained, they, they can get into this, uh, these anti-aging treatments because first they are non, uh, you know, minimally invasive, I would say and uh, they they don't require a lot of uh, establishment or yeah so if, if you're trained properly you can in, uh, include them in your routine practice uh, and the next one is skin rejuvenation which is all together along with the anti-aging treatments and then the hair and beard transplant and the next one is facelift which is by ridectomy as well as cervical pledges and plastic so this is for the cervical and platysmal area and right the depth level is for right eyes, like for, for your face. All right, so let's go for the next one, which is like the forehead lift or the bro lift. So as I just explained it to you, it's more over this area because uh, we, we do have like our grandparents and even our parents and in few of us, we can see uh, that there is uh, aging phenomenon in, in our upper part of the face. So this is more dedicated towards the upper third, upper one third. So what essentially happens is with age, a like sagging of this area starts happening. So what's going to happen? Our eyebrows, they're going to go down. Like this is the supraorbital notch and it's going to even go further down. This is going to uh, give us a bulky appearance like over here on the, on the upper eyelid. So th this will give a non aesthetic look as well as uh, it's going to hamper some functions regarding your vision, especially for the Asians, it does this problem. So how do we perform this procedure? It's usually performed, uh, you know, under the general anesthesia and there are two methods for performing a forehead lift. And it depends like on the extent of sagging and what kind of treatment, uh, it could be uh, more aggressive or it could be like rather uh, conservative. So for the more aggressive version, what we do is we, we just give a hairline one incision and there could be less aggressive, which is trichophytic prolift, 
in which we are going to give, uh, which is endoscopic. So we are going to give like five to six uh, small incisions in the hairline. So I'll just show it to you through the pictures. So uh, as we can see over here, like in the figure one, we do have a uh, mid forehead lift uh, incision and uh, indirect bro lift incision. So uh, we can uh, plan the incisions and the C1 is the direct bro lift. So over here, I do have a case which I'm going to present and that is for the direct bro lift incision. And as you can see this, uh, this patient, she was discussed with, with this complaint because as you can see like her, um, can you see the scrolling? Okay. All right, yeah. So as you can see like her, her supraorbital notch over here, her eyebrows, they have receded, which is giving her uh, a bulky appearance on the upper eyelid. So what we have done for her is just like, we have calculated the total amount. We have planned an incision just over it, preserving the nerves. And then we are going to incise. We have done the incision on the left side. And then in the next picture on the right side, then we have done the subcuticular sutures and approximation. And uh, after that, we have put on cuticular sutures. So remembering this, like the, when we are doing the closure, the, the main point would be uh, just approximation right over the eyebrow. So whenever the, you know, this patient is developing even a scar first, because the laxity of the skin is quite good. So he, she's not going to develop an ugly scar. And whatever she is going to develop is just going to develop in this particular region. So it, it would be camouflaged with the eyebrow. So we just need to take care of whether we plan the incision. Otherwise, like uh, if properly trained uh, and if hemostasis is maintained, this, this gives quite uh, uh, an obvious result and right at that point of time. So as you can see, like now her eyebrows look well above the supraorbital notch rather than the previous one when they were receding, they, they were like low. And in the next one, they're, they're lifted high. So as you can see, even on the upper eyelid, uh, not too much of sagging is evident now. So the sagging has pretty much gone just because of this direct bro lift. All right, so the next procedure would be blepharoplasty. Blepharoplasty is the surgery of the eyelids. So it's like for the upper eyelid as well as the lower eyelid. And the reason behind would be because we can see with aging, like you know, even in our parents or grandparents, we, we can see it. this is very common like, uh, you know, always on the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid, uh, there is excessive saggy bags, which, which develop under eyes. Uh, so we call them eye bags. And uh, for, especially for Southeast Asians and Indians, uh, it's quite evident like uh, losing fat from here or developing some fat uh, deposits from here. So th this leads to developing of uh, saggy appearance, which gives you a very tired look. So this is what we do, like uh, this is how we plan the incision. The incision is planned like this, and then we have to take out some bulging fat, reshape it. And for the lower one, there are three types of approach. We can go subsidiary, transconductival, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, because it differs, or subsidiary, it, it differs from uh, surgical preference, how the surgeon is more comfortable with, like what which approach suits him best. And what we essentially do used to be like previously, it used to be the excision of the fat, but now uh, it has uh, evolved from, uh, rather than excising, we have to transpose it. Transposing gives it further support. And in this way we can uh, save the fat as well as uh, uh, maintain the volume. So in this particular patient, so this, this is a classic case of uh, aging blepharoplasty. Why do the agents need? Because uh, as we all know, like uh, their eye opening is quite restricted. The reason being, they don't have a very well-defined crease on the upper eyelid. Uh, this crease leads to like, they couldn't really open it. But uh, for this Asian blepharoplasty, what you do is you just excise a piece of, uh, you, you know, like uh, skin and musculature, just a very thin uh, layer. And after that, you do the approximation. This will give, uh, a development of a crease. So when this crease develops, they can open their eyes uh, further better. So it improves their vision. So that's why it's called a double eyelid, 
because now it appears like they, they do have two eyelids, so it's called double eyelid surgery. And so when, when is it considered? So it's uh, it's an option when there are droppy upper eyelids or uh, you know the excess skin of the upper eyelid which interferes with the peripheral vision or if you have excess of skin on the lower eyelids or um, even like when you're going for another procedure such as like grow lift or if you have to go for facelift or skin resurfacing. So for, for these kind of things, uh, you, you might consider and your surgeon might suggest you undergoing uh, blepharoplasty. So how we do like H and double eyelid surgery, which is blepharoplasty. So uh, we will mark the line of incision, then we will make an incision lining. After that, we will do, in the first picture, we have done the extrusion. And then uh, in the next one, we, we are, uh, you know, incising the layer and then we across the motion. And in this way, you can appreciate the difference on the, on the right hand side, like the extreme lower right hand side. You can see how, how it goes, like from a patient who has no cell defined crease to someone who, who can uh, essentially see uh, this kind of crease. All right, I'll switch to the next one. And this is like the lower eyelid nephroplasty. So as you can see in this particular patient, you can see like there, there is a huge amount of uh, fat, uh, this fat descent on, on, the, on the right side, like a uh, very light right lateral side. So what we are going to do is we will remove a bit of fat and then we are going to transpose the, the fat over there. And this is like in the second picture, you can see like the transposition of fat is there. What potentially happens is uh, with, with age, like we, we do have fat pads over here, just like uh, we know about the buckle fat pad, we, we do have uh, eye fat pads as well. So they are like soup and groove, like supraorbital and yeah. So we, we do have these fat pads. And uh, with aging, these fat pads start receding, they, they start going down. So once they go down, the, the new phenomenon and the new recommendations are uh, instead of excising or taking away this fat, what we can do is we can transpose it. We can bring it back to the same uh, anatomic location. So uh, I, I think you can see and appreciate in the second picture itself, uh, it's quite clear that they have reapproximated. And now this is why like the skin now uh, has a support under it, like of a fat pad of, uh, with, with a new transposed layer with the new, uh, you know, fat transposition. So th this won't be uh, giving it an appearance like sunken or deep or walled out. So mm, th this is how we perform the lower eyelid blepharoplasty. And so there, there are a couple of techniques like for the upper eyelid, it's just like from the first picture, you can see like the nasal fat pad or it's also called medial fat pad. And then there is pre aponeurotic and on, on the other side, uh, there is the lacrimal gland. So we, we need to carefully excise a small band of fat pad, a very small band of fat pad over here, and then give it a crease, and then we do the, the suturing and reapproximate it. Uh, the only key to this procedure is to achieve a good hemostasis. Uh, this is a really bad complication for for blepharoplasty, uh, like if, if we have to go for a good tip, the tip would be essentially uh, before before you close, because uh, when we are injecting adrenaline, it stops the blood for that point of time. But after a couple of hours, like three or four hours, it stops fusing, and uh, the chances of developing a hematoma and other complications really uh, increase. So it's better before you close, um, just cauterize it quite well and uh, this will uh, provide you good results. And um, the, the results can be appreciated after, I would say like, it grows better with time, I'd say. So after a month or so, it starts getting better. So just like this particular case, uh, somehow like because of the cold age, it just stops like that because the pre-op one, you can see there is no crease like when the patient closes and we help her get a good crease. And for the second one, this is this procedure is called epicanthoplasty. So we, we are doing epicanthotomy, like this is the epicanthus of the eye. 
quite close to the nose and well we, we are just giving it uh, a small opening because for a few of the patients um their eye uh opening is restricted because of the epicanthus so if we release the epicanthus yeah uh, then it provides a good opening for these kind of patients so uh, there could be two possible options either for just going for uh, upper eyelid blepharoplasty, the other one could be upper eyelid blepharoplasty with epicanthoplasty or epicanthoplasty. So, and there is a picture for the lower one, as you can see, like we, we have given an incision and over there we have seen, like this is the, the approach it used to be like a couple of years ago. Like we have to cut down the fat, but now we don't really cut uh, too much of fat. We rather preserve the fat and we are doing the fat transposition to a uh, better suited anatomic location. And then after that, we, we just close it. All right, so next we will go with the rhinoplasty part. So rhinoplasty is the surgery that changes the shape of the nose. Definitely we know that. And it cha also changes the appearance of the nose. It could be for aesthetic reasons. It could be to improve uh, that patient's breathing, or else, like if she has a uh, deviated nasal septum or uh, any, any kind of pathology she might be developing, so we, we can do the, the rhinoplasty procedure with uh, septal rhinoplasty, or it could be just the augmentation, or it could be just the cosmetic procedure. So, before that, we can understand like where all the modifications are possible. So, first is like for the nasal bone, definitely. And for the upper lateral cartilage and the lower lateral cartilage. So, mo most of the problems just lie uh, in these particular regions. So, uh, doing a bit of changes as well as nasal septum. So, if, if we are doing uh, kind of changes over here, yes, it should be good for the patient. So, let's see. There, there are two kinds of rhinoplasty one is open rhinoplasty, the another one is closed rhinoplasty. The like, if you're asking which one is better or yeah, it still depends on how you are trained and which procedure are you more confident about. So I prefer to go for open rhinoplasty rather than closed because it gives me a better vision and minimal amount of scar. But in closed, there is no scar. So it depends from people to people. And it's totally a surgeon's preference. So as we can see, like this, the, the anatomy for the anatomy, just like there is a nasal septum and there is uh, upper lateral cartilage and the lower lateral cartilage. And before, for the open rhinoplasty, you can see like we, we just place an incision over here. And after that, we just uh, incise it, keep it open under the column line. And in the closed rhinoplasty, we give it with it. So that we, we don't go out. Like we, we don't give the external incision, that's why it's all closed. So this is a particular case which we operated like a couple of years ago. And uh, this young boy, he had a cleft deformity and uh, he visited us. He already had his uh, cleft surgery for his lip already done. And this time he came for uh, his uh, nasal augmentation because he was kind of having that uh, septal radiation as well as uh, nasal deformity. So for this, because we were lacking a cartilage, we thought uh, his auricular cartilage would be good enough to provide him the required augmentation. So what we did for this patient is just like, uh, in the third picture, it's not quite clear, but if you see on the extreme right, what we do is like, we go on the posterior auricular area. I'll later show like how to harvest these grafts. We just harvested uh, auricular cartilage. From the fourth picture, you can very well appreciate it. And from there, we just gave it a shape to support the straw, to support the nasal septum. And after that, we, we did a closure. And you can see in the profile, like uh, I did open rhinoplasty. And yeah, this patient got quite satisfactory results in, in terms of like he had a depressed saddle and now we're like quite even. And this is for another patient. And she, she came here for her, uh, you know, because she, she was not happy with her uh, nasal hump or Dorsum's appearance. So what we did was like we use a silicone nasal implant. And you can see that in the picture. 
uh, uh, this particular case, we, we gave her, uh, we placed an, a silicon nasal implant for her. And after that, you can see the results for the augmentation for this particular patient. And the next one, are, are we going to fast or is, is it fine? Uh, I'm looking for your feedback. Are, are we going fast or are, are we are we good? So just let me know because it's uh, it might be a little longer. So all right, okay, 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 okay. All right, let's keep going. So the next one is like facial implants, and why would we require these kind of implants? Because um, as we just like age, or maybe there is a loss of some anatomic structure due to some pathology or some trauma or some any any other issue. So we might consider placing some implants over there. So there are different kinds of implants, like cheek implants. There could be implants on the chin, uh, and there could be some jaw implants to so as to improve the jawline. Because th there are people will with maldefined jaws, so uh, we still do have an option. Like yeah, definitely we are not going to substitute it uh, as uh, as in like DSSO or for genioplasty, but still it offers us a good option for patients who might not be willing for. Uh, long procedure, they, instead of going for genoplasty, they, they might just like to go for uh, chin implants. So just like every everything has got pros and cons, so uh, it depends like on the patient's requirement as well as like how the surgeon plan, plans it. So it, they, they can even go for some facial implants. All right, so j just for this patient, this particular patient, as we can see, his jawline uh, was not so well defined. Like, as you can see in the first picture, uh, you know, the body and the ram is like, it's not totally defined. So for, for this patient, uh, it was suggested to have a CAT CAM model, like, uh, and after the this smiling and designing, the, the implants were customized and fabricated. And when they were placed, like, as you can see, in the post-op picture, especially the lateral one, you can see like he has a more distinct and more well-defined jaw now. So then this is one of the things like we can consider. And definitely for chin implants, I think like yeah, it's like quite a trend. Okay, so now like uh, we can go for lip repositioning procedure, which is called chiloplasty. So uh, why do people go for that? Because mostly because of aesthetic reasons. So um, the aims of lip surgery they are is to achieve a harmony like within the upper and the lower lip. And some people, uh, you, you know, they want to remove the excess. And there are people who who uh, want to go for the augmentation, especially in a cupid's bow arrow fashion. So uh, these things are like quite contemporary, and they, they keep changing from time to time. So it's not going to be the same thing or the same trend all the time. So for now, it's more about the augmentation. But there are people with aging, what they do is like we do a subnasal lift. So I'll also explain and show it to you in a couple of my cases. Mm -hmm. And there are patients who feel like uh, their lip are too bumpy and yeah, they, they want to uh, you know have a better and well-defined shape. So for those kind of candidates, yeah, it, it's something they, they want to consider. So I'll just show like how, how we are doing that. Uh, we are just going to give a, a curve infusion. So it could be on the inner side of the lip if we have to do the reduction. If we have to uh, do a lip lift, we have to go for some nasal one. So I do have a case for the lip lift as well. So I'll just show you like in this coming picture. All right, so it's also called bullhorn or it's also called m type and uh, subnasal, so because it's right under the, the nose. So for this particular patient, she had complaints 
like this part up to the symptom, she felt it's quite long. She wanted it to be a little smaller first. The second one is her lip. She found it bulky and she wanted her lips to be thin. So for this particular patient in the upper lip, as you can see, uh, we, we made the markings and then we have to <clears throat> do the excision. So the excised tissue is on the, 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 the post-op pick. So you can see like this is the excised mass. We have done the closure right there. And for the upper lip, as you can see, sutures. So I think in this particular case, the sutures could be even inner, but we had a limitation because first we did uh, some nasal closure. So definitely after that, if we do the, the lip reduction and this part, which should lie within, it comes out. But anyways, like it's on the lip, so it heals well. The scar is not too obvious. So we can, you know, go for these stimulated procedures or we can either go just for the, the, the subnasal lip lift. Uh, just like for this, uh, another patient, we, we have to do this kind of excision because uh, as you can see for this particular patient, the problem was uh, first, like uh, she found this, this lining is too big so she wanted it to be lifted. So this is what we did. You can see in the, uh, in the second last picture. And the second one was, uh, she found her filter was too wide. So she wanted to reduce the, the, the width of, of this filter. So in order to do that, we have to, again, do a white shape, shape uh, exclusion. Okay. So uh, this is what we uh, involved, like in this particular procedure with accumulation, we did. So we did some markings like 6 mm and 18 mm, and then we carried out the reduction. So what we need to do is we need to make sure and design our incisions. So uh, the incisions essentially should lie from the LR base to the other LR base. It should not go beyond the LR base. So this is how you put them in the crease. And then while you're suturing, you don't suture downward, you suture upwards so that it gives a support and a lift to your nose. If you do it downward, you will be leading to enlargement of the, the you know, the nostrils, which, which is not going to give a super good appearance to this particular patient. So these are three particular keys. So uh, the, the main objective of me uh, presenting this particular presentation today is so that more and more of our colleagues, we, we can get to know like what all procedures are covered in. And because not many doctors, they, they are trained in all these procedures because as we all know in India and in some of other countries, plastic surgery is more of a reconstruction work and less of a cosmetic work. But this is more of a cosmetic work and less of reconstruction. So the training is different and uh, the number of cases we are operating on, uh, it's totally like uh, quite, quite a different field. So nobody is an expert at it. So if, if people are learning the base, so I don't think any other professionals have an edge on us because they haven't been trained for this particular part either. So if we are well trained, if we are uh, quite confident about doing these procedures, we should take a lead and establish ourselves like in this particular thing. And, uh, and these are more surgical procedures. So yeah, definitely a surgical hand is something we, we require for these kind of cases. But if not these, there are uh, other cases which I'm going to cover shortly, which are the anti-aging, aesthetic medicine and skin rejuvenation procedures. All those procedures we can go, go for, like even in our basic dental clinic. And we can, uh, you know, like get, get them going in our routine dental practice as well. All right, so this was about chiloplasty. I'll go for the next one now, uh, which is auricular lobuloplasty and otoplasty. I'm sure like it is uh, Indian women, they, they like to wear these earrings and at times they're like heavy and yeah, so most of the time whenever I'm going back home, I do have a couple of relatives who might be asking me to perform this kind of procedure because uh, a couple of years ago, I performed on one of them and after that, it started just like a reaction. So th this is something which you can do and it's uh, not 
uh, you know, if you have a good understanding, this is one of the very commonly done procedures, like very commonly done, and it could be, uh, you know, carried out just under local anesthesia. The good thing is they don't require a really big OT setup. These are minor surgery or daycare surgical procedures, so you can just perform them or a chair type procedure or in office gloves. So, and then we, uh, so how we do this and uh, just like repairing these deformities or might be enlarged earlobe or might be torn away. And then this procedure is performed under the local anesthesia and it involves the removal of the old scar tissue. So as you can see, like in this particular picture, I did the removal, you can see in the second one on the extreme right, so I did the removal of the old scar tissue and then reposition the existing earlobe to create a natural look. So dissolving sutures are placed in the earlobe and the, and the piece of tape is used to cover. But the only different thing over here is uh, we should not really hurry up. Uh, I prefer to do a three layer closure, which is like one is the intracuticular and then front and then behind. Uh, in this way, uh, the, the healing is quite fast and it gets completed within seven days. But there are people who prefer to go for a two-layer closure for, and there, there is a, like two-layer closure. And for those particular cases, uh, I would suggest, yeah, not, not to be in a hurry, like wait, give it a time for 10 days, uh, possibly because of the vascularity is not that great over here. So in my personal experience, removing the sutures on the sixth day or the seventh day might not be really good results. But yeah, definitely if you give it a good time for 10 days, yeah, I think uh, for this particular area, you can give it a like, good 10 days. All right, so how is autoplasty carried out? We might require, because uh, just now I mentioned and showed you one of my cases where I did the uh, auricular augmentation. So uh, the surgical site is essentially the same. It's like the posterior auricular area where we go and we give an incision after, uh, you know, we prepare the surgical site. And after that, we excise, uh, because you might have seen people with protruding ears like that. And if we need to reapproximate, what we have to essentially do is we need to cut that extra part of the cartilage, which is protruding. And so I have also shown uh, in, in this particular step too, like how the reapproximation is done and, and how the suturing part is done. So when you suture, you reapproximate these two parts. And at the very same moment, uh, when, when you are doing the reapproximation, you can see like the earlobe, which was um, protruded outwards, it comes inwards when, as soon as you tie the suture. So what you have to do is just, you have to tie and yeah, after that you, you have to close it quite well. So th that's the same operating area from where you can even harvest a cartilage graft which might be required for the nose or elsewhere for any part of your face if uh, you want a small amount of cartilage. And yeah, this is how you do the closure and yeah, you can get good results from autoplasty. But again, uh, it's not a technique sensitive thing, but it definitely requires a lot of experience to get uniform results for autoplasty. So just for this particular guy, you can see like he had those protruding ears and what I have also demonstrated the surgical approach, like the skin was removed. After that, the cartilage was reshaped. What means reshaping could be, there could be a bulge, which could be reshaped with a file, cartilage file, or uh, there could be an excess of cartilage, which needs to be cut out. And then you have to reapproximate it. So in either way, you just bring them back to its uh, original form, you need to make sure you need to take measurements about the amount of cartilage you need to grow so as to get a uniform results. And after that, yeah, you, you can do the closure and you can get good results. All right, so the next procedure is uh, liposculpture, so which involves liposuction, which involves fat grafting, which in involves fat pad removal, all, all these kind of things. So uh, there's quite a bit of text over here. So what we do is like, uh, I'll just, uh, I won't really go through this, uh, like what I've written. Uh, I'll just tell you what essentially is done. Uh, 
there, there are people who have the complaint of either hollowing of their face or losing fat from their face or sunken faces or faces which look aged. So when we do age, what really happens is we develop a sunken appearance and our, uh, you know, we develop a saggy face because of the less, less of collagen, less lack of uh, fat pads. And uh, with, with our aging, you know, these fat pads be become saggy and they start to fall, uh, giving our face a kind of tired appearance. So for these particular kind of cases, what we do is, uh, we will do fat filling to restore the original volume. This is one of the options. For some young patients, they have a complaint of, they, they want their faces to look not so fat. They, they might develop uh, some amount of fat under their chin, which is called double chin. And, uh, or else they, they might have some huge fat pads, which is giving their face quite a bulky appearance, like some cheap fat or malarcidal. So there, there could be different sites. So what we do is we essentially uh, do liposuction from these areas. And just like from the cheek or the buckle part, we do the fat excision. So this is how you sculpt uh, the fat on your face. So th there could be different reasons for um, doing the liposculpture. And most of the time it's uh, for um, the augmentation or uh, at times it's for, um, how to say, uh, just getting it transformed to a more aesthetically uh, appearing appearance. So what we are doing is like for different areas, we do have different kinds of cannulas and different sizes. So if we have to do submental liposuction, we will just go and give a stab infusion in the submental crease. Uh, we will go with different cannulas and we will just do the, the liposuction from this area. So as you can see, there are uh, some cannulas which are like cross hatched, and in this way, the expiration is quite good. The other one could be from the plethysma as well as from the face. So, this is another surgical site. So, but this is how you enter you just give a stab incision, and then, yeah, you enter through that. And this is like literally your approach. Uh, so this is one of the cases I performed on and she was not willing for other areas. So I had to go for like these two. One was cemental and the other one was uh, lateral ear approach. So I, I just did uh, the liposuction for her lower part of the face as well as till neck. So this is uh, the picture uh, pre-op and the other one is like on the fourth day. So yeah, even on the fourth day, she, she will still shed some volume and yeah, after that she will be losing a little bit more. And then because liposuction is not for a lifetime, it depends more, of, more on your habits, like how, how you carry it on. So uh, yeah, these were like the immediate results we obtained after a couple of days. All right, so this is the case. Uh, I think it's going to take a while to load. So as you can see, like this lady, she had uh, the chief complaint of uh, aging face and she, well, in, in her terms, she said like, she, she feels that she has a manly appearance. She thinks she looks like uh, a man because uh, she has already lost her fat pads and yeah, there, there's a massive loss of collagen as well. So she wanted skin rejuvenation. She wanted her face to look full and not too sunken. So th these are the first like two, uh, what, one of them is the left lateral and one of them is the front one. So I have put comparing pictures like on the extreme left and uh, extreme right, lower right, like these are the post-op ones. So you can see what we did for this particular patient and then we, we harvested fat from her thigh. So we, we harvested fat from a thigh and uh, for this particular case, emulsification of the fat was done and fat was prepared and uh, 
because I have done some markings on the face because different areas will require Sure, doctor, I'll just cover that. So, because different areas will require a different consistency of fat. So, the amount of fat which needs to be injected uh, will differ from area to area because fat fillers are quite unforgiving if, if you're not really trained for doing the fat fillers because they are kind of considered permanent fat fill permanent fillers. So, it's better to have a good understanding of what you're injecting and where you're injecting before you are doing fat fillers. So for this particular patient, we prepared the fat and then we injected onto different anatomic sites, uh, which were her temple region, which were her malar and the cheek region, and even her, or we did the augmentation for her chin. Yeah. So the, these are the these are the pictures like post-op you can see. I'll take this question by Dr. Sumini. Please give some insight about new facial treatment, which could be done by general dentists in their operatory and their local anesthesia, and comparatively less invasive. That will help many dentists here. Nice presentation. Thank you. So, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I'm just giving you a total insight because um, a few of my friends who are a fellow plastic surgeons as well as ENT surgeons, and um, and yeah. So they, they're also here. So I'm just covering uh, vast variety, and definitely, yeah. Uh, I'll be doing all those procedures you mentioned, like and skin rejuvenation. So I understand most of us like might not be from the surgical background. So I'll definitely be covering those topics, I guess, in like like next five to ten minutes. All right. So for the orthopedic surgery, I don't think I need to go into too much of depth. But as you can see, like the first one is like the fourth one osteotomy, the second one is DSSO, and the third one is genioplasty. But what's different going on in here, I'll show you. It's more of a V-line surgery osteotomies. People over here, they don't really like this kind of face. They would like a V kind of face because uh, K-pop culture in South Korea is like very, very famous. And most of the people, they want to look like those stars. So in this, uh, we have uh, developed or this is a new surgical approach where we have to enhance the appearance or make some changes in the facial skeleton rather than going for the conventional osteotomies. These are the new style of osteotomy. Yeah, so this, this is what we do. Like we, we just give it a wee shape. Uh, so like our orthognatic surgeries, which were conventional, maybe they are not uh, working over here, not for too many of them. So even with people who have no uh, dental anomaly or orthognatic anomaly as such, still they are going for orthognatic surgeries so as to get this kind of appearance, like uh, we shape. So just like uh, this is one of the cases, you can see like from this kind of face to we kind. So she, she did osteotomies for, for this particular reason and this particular case. All right, so I'll be starting with uh, anti-aging and skin rejuvenation treatments. Uh, I hope you can just give me a minute and I'll just get some water for myself. You guys can also have some water, please. Just, just give me like two minutes.
So just give me a thumbs up if you're there and let's get started. So can you hear me? All right, okay. <clears throat> so as you can see in the screen, so it's like anti-aging and skin rejuvenation treatments. So for first who are uh, not from a surgical background or not trained uh, surgeons for facial plastic surgery, we can rather go for non-invasive or minimally invasive surgical treatments, provided uh, you have a thorough understanding because uh, these days I, I have seen like there are a couple of people who are practicing this and even three of my juniors, I, I encourage all, each and all, like to, to you know, develop such kind of practice. But um, at any point of time, you should, if, if you're getting into this, uh, I will hugely recommend you to, to gain a lot of experience because uh, there, there are a few things uh, we need to realize before getting into the aesthetic practice. If there, if we encounter, uh, case of trauma that particular patient when, when you're doing his laceration repair when, whenever you are doing a good surgical closure his expectations would not be that high with the with the wound he's going to with, with the healed thing he's going to take back home but for uh, a patient who is undergoing knife or any other surgery or any other aesthetic procedure his expectations from that particular treatment would be really high so um, this, this is a session where I'm trying to encourage more and more of uh, our practitioners to, to get uh, these things into their routine practice. At the same time, I'm just giving you a word of caution and I didn't uh, put some complication pictures over here, but uh, I do encounter kinds of complications. So a thorough understanding and after that, uh, you know, getting into cosmetic practice is something I'd recommend, right? So just like any other thing, it comes with complications, but with aesthetics, uh, the risk is a little high because of the higher expectations. So I, I hope you are getting what I mean to say. And uh, let me just show you something. Even like I have been in cosmetic practice for like last seven years, but um, you know, uh, you might find books like on my table. So whenever I'm at home and if, if I have like got nothing better to do, I'll just uh, try to spend a good time studying them or reading more and more about them. So th this is something like uh, which is an ongoing process. I've done quite a lot of cases for all of these that it's always good to, you know, enhance your knowledge. So I'll definitely be uh, 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 briefing you about all these procedures. So the first one is Botox, which we usually call, which is botulinum toxin A. And then we have to understand the amount of units available. And then we have dermal fillers. And fillers could be of uh, different kinds. So uh, it could be a fat filler. It could be, you know, just like hyaluronic acid. 
and there are different kinds of collide suspensions as well. So, but what we are using chiefly is like uh, these hyaluronic acid fillers. And uh, dermal fillers, they have a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing about it is like it offers instant results. And uh, the good thing about it is it's reversible. The bad thing about it is if you are not having a really good idea and if you are injecting it in some artery or uh, elsewhere, like it could even lead to necrosis. And there, there have been cases where, which have caused blindness in such cases. So a thorough understanding for these kind of things would be good. And the next one is PRP, which is quite commonly known. Uh, you, you know, it's it's like a combination. It could be either injected just like in hairs. It could be even done for skin rejuvenation. It could be even done for um, facelift. And it could be even like vampire facial. And the other one is microdermabrasion. The next one is thread lifts, which is like PDO threads or PPDO in different kinds of threads, cog threads. Uh, the next one is lasers. The next one is chemical peels. Hydrofacial, this is a relatively new thing, like now in India. And the next one is microblading, which is also called as tattooing. So it could be tattooing of the sideburns, tattooing of the eyebrows. Yeah. And uh, the next one is aesthetic medicine, which could be for uh, different reasons. And it's kind of um, Aesthetic medicine is for, even for anti-aging, it's good for your skin and different kinds of things. So uh, let's go from case to case. So this particular case is for uh, showing like how Botox works. So Botox works essentially on the nerve endings, paralyzing, uh, you, you know, the nerve endings so that normal conduction is uh, performed, or like nerve conduction. So, the impulses are not transmitted and the, the activity of the muscle thereby uh, reduces, which essentially leads to uh, the previously, previously what happens like for uh, the first two pictures, as you can see, like uh, we get some Botox shots uh, on, on the forehead, like in the glandular region, as well as uh, the other one is in the crow's feet, which is like side of the eyes to get rid of the wrinkles. So this is one of the uses of Botox. The second one is you can see a picture of a young lady on, on the left-hand side, lower left. So you can see the, the enhanced appearance in her picture from, from a, you know, a bigger looking face to a smaller one. Uh, this is because of uh, massive trait hypertrophy. So in this particular patient, like I, I do have a picture for another lady uh, she's an Indian lady. I remember I, I performed shots on her on my last workshop in India. So uh, e even she had this same problem for masseter hypertrophy. So what we did was we injected in her masseter. Uh, the, the technique is not that sensitive, but the preparation and counting of units is sensitive. So I've got a couple of workshops there to do. So, So I'll just show one of these. Okay, so these are my used ones, so I'm not going to take them out. So I'll just take one of these out. So uh, as you can see, uh, can you see from the box? Like it says 100 units. Right, so this is in a powder form. We have to dilute it with saline. So you can dilute these 100 units into the amount of saline you mix. So different people, they maybe if, if you dilute it in two ml, so each ml would have 50 units. If you dilute that in 2.5 ml, so one cc would be having 40 units. So it's all about the calculation thing. And then you can see how many units do you need to inject. So. So it's like this. So th this is called reconstitution of the Botox. This is how you reconstitute it because it's available in a powder form. Then you add uh, normal saline to it, or you can even add sterile water to it. 
and then we reconstitute it. Aspirate it, and then you inject it. So for the masseter side, uh, the amounts of units would differ. It's not even essentially going to be the same for both sides. It could differ. Uh, the side which has more of a hypertrophy, you can even inject like 30 units over there. And on the contralateral side, if it's not too big, you can inject 20 to 30, 30 units. So that's more of a clinical judgment thing. For your upper forehead, you, know, you can range from 12 to 20 units. And then, yeah, again, uh, 4, 3, 3 units and 12, yeah, and 12 on the other side. So essentially, 100 units is good enough for entire face if you are covering the masseter. If not, just like 20 plus or 30 units for your forehead as well as crow's feet. So this is about Botox, like you can do some injections for the Botox, which you can, uh, you know, do in your daily clinical practice if you develop an aesthetic practice. And these are the dermal fillers. So we will go one by one. So I, I just uh, happened to collect a few of the videos from our center and I'll just show you. In the first one, you can see this is, this is an injection and uh, this pretty little patient, she is getting her under eye area and the cheek pro cheek area getting more uh, defined. So I'll just play this one and you can have a look. So after you deposit something over here, you have to distribute it. So let's see it again. You have to gently massage it along the line. Let's see it again. Just like that. All right, now let's go for the next one. So you can see like uh, this particular area is going over here. So probably too much to define it more. So what you can see is uh, this particular lady, she has hold it. Uh, she's holding the filler not to flow into the orbital region. So she's just going to maintain it in the crease, supraorbital notch itself. So I'll just play the second one. So in this, we are injecting and at the same time, we are withdrawing the needle. Injecting and withdrawing. Let's have a look one more time. The injecting and the drawing. Just like that. All right, and the third one is about um, Botox shots in the masseter for masseter hypertrophy. Uh, it's also called face thinning needle over here. So face uh, thinning injections. Because it gives your face a thin appearance. Let's see. We do it at multiple spots. One, two. So there are a couple of shots like this, at least like eight to 10 spots, where, wherever you find uh, your masseter is hypertrophied. Just like this. All right, okay, let's go for the next one. And this is hydrofacial, and on her lower part of the face, what we have done is that we have applied a uh, local anesthetic, and it's going to take like more than 30 minutes because the skin absorption is not that well. So in hydrofacial, we can put some skin tonics, or uh, you know, it could be even done with a combination of uh, anti-aging uh, products. And after that, you do hydration of the skin, just like I do have one of those products like a uh, derma product. Let me just show it to you. So they contain uh, PEG 100 and uh, C1215. Like th these are the compounds and this is a Spanish product. So uh, I'm using this particular product for in combination with my hydrofacial. So this offers quite a good result and it's quite effective.
So we'll go with the hydrofacial one. So in this, like we do have again some micro needles, like some small needles, and uh, which are going to inject uh, and create uh, multiple defects so that the, the healing takes place in an orderly manner. Why we are trying to injure the skin? What, what what's the main intention? The main intention is to create deformity so that the skin is irritated and it starts generating more and more collagen. So this is the entire intent. So just like, let's have a look. Just like this. You just keep punching it at different spots. Let's have a look one more time. Sure, I'll do, I'll do. Like my uh, next few cases are going to follow that. And this is for the augmentation of the cheek by using fillers. All right, okay, so as Dr. Swapnil, he asked me like about the cases pre and post. Yeah, these are a couple of my cases. Mm, you can see. Like then they range from acne scars to any different kinds of uh, hypertrophic or atrophic scars. Yeah. So these are a couple of my cases, which I have operated and I have put pre and post pictures for them. I guess you can see quite some difference. Uh, for dermophil and other facial injectables, for the facial fillers, they itself come with a 30 gauge or 32 gauge needle. And, uh, I'm responding to Dr. Kuchil now. And yeah, for the Botox ones, I do have 28 or 30 gauge needles because it's better to use not too thin needles for the masseter because masseter, they are usually strong and the patient, he might, uh, you know, use them while you inject them. So there is a risk of breakage. That's why I prefer to use 28 to 30 for masseter. And for the facial injectables like dermal fillers, they, they come with uh, needles, like in those needles, which are usually of 32 gauge. Yeah, if, if uh, the, the filler which you're ordering, if it's not coming with a needle, you can go for 30 or 32 gauge. For the facial fillers, if I have to do the facial fillers under eyes, in the temple region, in the nasal labial folds, I would prefer to go for cannulas. I will not go for needles. Because when you are going for a needle, you might accidentally deposit that um, filler in the artery, and which could lead to arterial embolism as well as uh, lead, uh, leads to necrosis. So I have seen lots and lots of cases because I'm also uh, a trainer for allergen in China. So I'm, I'm training the students all around China, like other doctors in China or allergen. So th there we do have like uh, quite, quite a lot of cases with which we have encountered. So that uh, like that, that's the copyright of the allergen. So I can't use them over here. But yeah, I, I have seen uh, quite a good number of cases uh, with such complications. So it's better to go for um, cannulas and yeah, a blunt end of cannulas. Do these treatments pose any sort of risk or complication in the daycare facility? Um, this, these kind of treatments, uh, you know, you need to make sure about, um, like, is the person allergic and to any of these products? So you might require testing, especially when you understand the contents of the medicines, because there are quite a lot of, um, how to say, cheap quality products. This is how I would define because. I know of people who have done fillers who considering the markings because maybe there is a supplier who is providing them some some kind of product like which I have never heard of, which might not have the licenses because you know there are lots lots and lots of dealers these days. So they're just selling like 
each and everything. And in order to be price competitive, like people are buying anything. So I would still say first go for good quality products, have a thorough knowledge, and it's always good to have someone more experienced at your side, especially in the in the initial days of practice, so that you can um, uh, you know have a backing of someone who, who can guide you in the right way regarding the the how to say. Mm. The selection of the patients and regarding the, the treatment outcomes the patient can expect. Because every time we are taking a patient for aesthetic procedures, we promise them something. And uh, if we are not up to his expectations, we are not doing any good because that particular patient is not sick. It's just like going to a saloon for a good haircut and you end up getting a bad haircut. Or maybe it's not bad, but it's not as for your expectations. So it's more about uh, letting your clients feel more satisfied. I wouldn't even say they are like our patients, they are more of our clients, yeah. So just like any other procedure, they might have risks, but uh, you can try to avoid them. And because it's uh, non or minimally invasive or very less, I have to say, like not even surgical procedures. So uh, I would say uh, if you, uh, keep all the protocols, like if you follow all the hygiene protocols, sterilization protocols, if you have a good knowledge, then I would consider all these procedures quite safe. No problem. Okay. So this is another case for thread lift. Okay. So this young lady, she came to us and then we have to find some vectors for the thread lift. So this is how like a uh, in, in the first picture, I have marked some vectors. In the second picture, I have, uh, you, you know, put in some threads from here, from the scab, and I have inserted the threads, and now it's the time that I have to cut them. And for the third one, I'm trying to show you what's the plane or what's the depth. So it's just under the skin. It's not in the muscle. We need to take care of this. We should try to avoid the lip because it's very sensitive over there. And yeah, and we go through a cannula. And after that, we need to secure this particular thing on the face. And I'll show you like these too many number of needles might look painful, but these needles are called filler threads. So they are filler threads, they add volume. And the placement for these is a little different from the routine threads. So I'll just play a video and let you see how it looks like. So it's under eye and all over the face, up to the jaw. Up to the lower border of the jaw. All right, we've got another question. Are such facial aesthetic treatments reversible? If so, then for how many years do they sustain? Are such facial aesthetic treatments reversible? Yeah, they are definitely reversible. For Botox, it gets reversed uh, after, because at times you might, uh, in, maybe, you know, just like process, you can uh, lead to like, if, if you're injecting in the wrong glandular regions, or if the patient rubs and spreads that Botox, uh, so if, if the, the toxin reaches the nerve endings, it might even lead to dropping of the upper eyelid. But the good thing is, like, yeah, after four weeks, it starts getting better, and by the third month, it's, uh, I would say, like, 80% of it's resolved. So it should be fine. For the complications with, uh, with, with the fillers, you need to be very careful about it. Uh, essentially, like the fillers, they they can uh, you know resolve with time. It, it might range from six months or even like cheap quality products from three months till if you're using a product from 
blurb in Jugadom, then it might say like Volume or Ultrafil, like you are using that. It could even stay for a little longer than a year or maybe a year and a half. So th this is something yeah you can do. And for PRP and Threadlets, they are just like skin tonics. So the effect is not going to wear off totally. So it's going to stay, but uh, yeah, it would not be that obvious after a couple of months. So if for just like I told you for Botox, it's pretty close to six months. For fillers, it could range from cheap products like for three to six months till a good quality product for a little more than a year or a year and a half. For thread lips, yeah, it can stay for uh, pretty close to one year. Yeah. And after that, if you are doing a touch up for thread, yeah, it should be good for like after six months or after a year. You can do not too aggressive, but a little one. Uh, small touch up would be good. And this is microblading. So you, you do have some ink and then you're, you're tattooing your eyebrow. Like, so this is permanent eyebrow. So you can even do that for your side bonds. So th this is something, yeah, which might be more in trend in India in the coming years. Like, yeah, uh, I, I have a name of few people who are already doing it, but not, not too many. Yeah, it's going to take some time. And then hair transplant, I think many of you might be practicing or many of your knowns might be practicing hair transplant. So it, uh, as we all know, like it could be the FUT or FUV. For me in my setup, what kind of practice I'm more in is FUT. I'm not doing much of hair transplant to be honest, but I have done FUT cases you know, where <clears throat> uh, the part which I have done more is uh, harvesting the graft, and that's done usually by FUT procedure. And I'll show you how I did it. Okay, so for this particular patient, we harvested a strip from the backside, and then we segregated the grafts. I prefer the grafts like the multi muted ones. Then I did the hair designing, like the hairline design. And the fourth picture, it's like a microscopic view, how it looks like, and then the placement. So if you, I'm quite sure it's just like using a device to do the follicular unit extraction, then assembling the grafts, and then placing them according to the site preparation. So the placement part is pretty much the same, but the <clears throat> process of harvesting is very different. So again, it differs from case to case and from preference to preference. So uh, we're going to come to the last topic, which is like the face work. Many operators now suggest FD. Uh, what's my take? Uh, I have written an article on FD and FUT, and uh, it's published in uh, Conference of Facial Plastic Surgery in Canada. I think that. That was in 2018. So it's like a Coke versus Pepsi debate. So like no, nobody is a winner because um, even for the clinical cases, both they do offer an edge of its own. So it differs from case to case and from clinical judgment, I would say. So I have also offered an article about it. If, if you wish, I can forward you the link later. So it's just like that kind of debate because. Even if you go for all the studies, both have shown long-term effects, like quite good and quite promising. So it's not so clearly distinct, but for me, because I'm more trained in the surgical procedures, I prefer to do FUT uh, over FU. For me, uh, FUT offers a better selection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, because um, for, for me, it, it's like my take of uh, having a better vision of the graphs and extractions are faster with FUT. So, because we, we do have a big team over here, and if I can give them, uh, you know, um, one by one size uh, flock, and they can harvest better graphs. So, that's why I prefer, like, it, it was back like one and a half years ago when, when I used to do these. I'm not doing more. Here, 
Right, let's go for the facelift. So the facelift or rigidectomy is a surgical procedure that improves visible signs of aging in the face and neck, just like relaxation of the skin of the face, which causes sagging, and it would be deepening of the fold lines between the nose, which are called the nasolabial folds, and the fat that has fallen or has disappeared. So the fat could be on the face, on the cheeks, or it could be under eye fat, or it could be jaws, the other thing in the cheeks and the jaw or it could be loose skin and excess fat of the neck that can appear as double chin. So for all, all these kind of procedures. So there are different kinds of techniques, like uh, it used to be a traditional facelift, and now it's like SMAS facelift. So there are different kinds, so mobilization, reposition, and fixation. So it's more of uh, we do imbricate and slicing. Uh, what essentially happens is when we gain the access inside, we pull out the SMAS layer, we can cut, which is like the plication, and then imbricate, which is like uh, re-feature it to a more tightened position. And then depending upon the different uh, techniques or whichever you prefer for that particular case, like it could be high level or it could be low level, it could be conservative or there are quite a lot of variants. So whatever like you are more into, you can choose that. And depending on that, it might require skin excision or not. So, uh, and the incision line could be pre-auricular or post-auricular as well, depending on uh, the technique which you're performing. So this is what I perform. Most of the patients these days, they are not really willing to undergo uh, you know, the traditional facelift. Uh, though traditional facelift or SMAS facelift, it's really, quite versatile and it offers really good results as compared. But uh, if you have to listen and consider from the patient's perspective, yeah, we, we can go for a lesser, uh, you know, aggressive. So in this particular, I did uh, MACF, which is minimal excess cranial suspension. And uh, I did it with elastic thread suspension. So th this is my patient, we upgraded on her. And you can see like her nasal labial folds, they are better, her jollos, they're better and her chin is more redefined. Even her, you know, the fat pad on the cheeks, it's quite good now. So, and these procedures, that they, they could be performed like daycare setting, very less bleeding. Yeah, especially if you're training it. Yeah, this, this is something the patient would really love to go for because uh, it's not that painful and yeah, it, it offers instant results. And uh, post follow up for such patients is quite good as well. So that's what I'm trying to say, like from this to this, like th this is the development, this, this is the trend for which, which have changed in the last few years. Uh, with cosmetic surgery evolving more and more, yeah, th thing, things are changing like uh, at a pretty good pace. And it's evolving from a more aggressive to a more conservative therapy offering, uh, if not equally good, but yeah, still good and uh, you know, considerably good results. So th this is the case I just did thread lift for her. And this is the same patient. So this can also offer a good result. So <clears throat> it's not going to stay for quite a long time. And uh, if you're going for a surgical facelift, uh, definitely it's going to stay for a little longer. And it's considered relatively permanent. So it's not permanent because uh, aging is a continuous process. It never stops. So yeah, you, you can still choose to go for these kind of procedures. So this is a case which had pretty much of everything. On the right hand side, you can see this lady. This is how she looks. And yeah, you can see the, you can see like her eyes. I'm really sorry because, um, you know, when I was putting my mane, it's quite close to her eyes, like to conceal her identity. So yeah, you can see her upper eyelids look bulky, so we did, her uh, upper eyelid blepharoplasty on the left hand side you can see for her. Uh, we did 
the definition of a nose. We redefined her nose. You can see her nose, alar base, is quite widened in this particular case. So we have uh, did like we have reduced the opening. We, we have brought them closer. Uh, all in all, like we, we did, uh, I think quite a good rhinoplasty for her. So she was quite contented with the the, the augmentation and the well defined doors, and as well as her nostrils. They they were not too big, so like she was quite contented. And we also did thread lips for her, even for her forehead. Yeah, so this this was a case like which had pretty much all everything. So uh, you might be wondering why do we have some you know some tapes or uh, uh, like uh, on her forehead? So you can see on the lateral side she has bleeding spots because we gave her a stab incision over there so that we can insert threads from there for the lift. We also did it for the forehead because she didn't want to go for um, endoscopic bro lift, but she still wanted some lift in her forehead and upper eyelids. So we just went for threads. So we had to uh, do some stabs on her forehead as well. And uh, the last one is on her zygomatic prompt from the, uh, so that we can lift the, uh, her under eyes as well as uh, we can get an access to the major labial poles. So this is, I guess, the last slide. And yeah, stay beautiful and stay healthy. I hope uh, the presentation today was, I, I know it went really too long, I, uh, more than one and a half hour, but there are a few inputs I would really like you guys to take from here. It's just like, if we are really trained, and this and yeah i guess we we, we understand uh, like we are really dedicated to the anatomy of the face definitely it's just the head and neck anatomy we so we have the best understanding at all so why not we start reading and getting more and more knowledge and start getting into these cosmetic procedures and cosmetic trends uh, it's always good to evolve yourself and you know with something which interests you it's something definitely which is of my interest so that's why i thought of you know exploring this more so yeah just just find out a way and just start getting into this kind of practice if you guys no problem welcome doc so if, if you have any questions or anything just just yeah feel free to attend me even on my facebook I do post these kind of cases, my clinical cases, on and off, uh, except at times like I get reminders from Facebook, yeah, yeah, for not posting these kind of surgical pictures. So I won't be able to really post uh, some aggressive surgical pictures or something, and I don't have, uh, uh, you know, a way to post on YouTube because I'm here in China. So yeah, Facebook and YouTube are really like, you know, not. Uh, you know, not having a good access to it. But at times I do get an access and I'm really more than, uh, you know, happy and really humble that I have this opportunity to uh, share a couple of my cases with you guys. And uh, I do pay a visit to India like three or four times a year. Uh, I'll be more than happy to see you there. So yeah, no problem. Um, I'm really happy. All right, so yeah, you are welcome. Uh, I really have a beautiful audience today. Thank you all for your time and your patience.